Hi, good afternoon, First Additional Language. It is now week two, and we're into integrated grammar teaching. Um, we started off by looking at structure and use of grammar last week, and now we continue in our journey into the exciting world of grammar and how we can keep it integrated. I'm also going to be touching on assignment one for semester, semester one, because I think it's due at the end of the month, so we're going to have to get cracking on this. Um, I'm going to send a separate video, which is one of your recommendations that you've made to me, um, about the, the actual assignment as well. So I'll, I'll be putting the assignment on ECI, only on turn it into submit, and I will add the video link there as well. Hope that'll be fine. Okay, I'm going to share my screen now with you. There we go. Let's start the show. Okay, uh, normal studio cover slide, and we're going into week two of semester two. We've been progressing gently across the way. And we're going to be looking at grammar. And I think when you think of grammar, you think about all these things, rules, communication, dictionaries, idioms, speech, prepositions, books, and so on. And the big thing is we're going to try and integrate all these aspects of grammar. If you look at that little visual I've put up there, it's um, a little paper doll, and it's got all kinds of adjectives on it. So you can describe yourself by taking a piece of paper, folding up like a fan, and they can write all the words and it becomes active use. It's not isolated grammar exercises anymore. It becomes something real and something fun. Okay, are you loyal, caring, brave, intelligent, cheerful and determined? So you can describe yourself, maybe the negative things about yourself and then a few of the positive things. Right, um, we had a little menti, um survey to see how you're feeling. And I gave a little insight last week after about two days, one day I think into it. And then I've got the further evidence of how you're all feeling at this moment. I think 94 of you answered the mentee survey. So that's about a third of you. So let's see how you're feeling. Let me know how you're feeling. So yes, again, positively, the biggest word is excited. So I'm quite pleased about that. There is a bit of happiness. Um, great. But there's also the overwhelmed people, the anxious people, the worried, the scared, um, the unhappy, um, exhausted already students, overwhelmed already. But I'm so glad some confident, hopeful, open-minded. So let's enter into the semester being positive. Um, let's get those marks up. I'm sure you're all traumatized by your marks. Some of you might be elated, but I think some of you are a bit upset about them. Um, but we can work on that as well. So stay excited. And we also did the Kahoot quiz, remember the survey, um, the question that was asked about how you felt about the welcome video and a bit of questioning about that. And yeah, we have the results. We have the top of the pops, the top 10 is Sher, Alex, Tahir, Sam, Danny B, Kiara, B, Amy, Cross, and Gerda. Well done. And there you are the, on, the, on the Olympic Stadium. Sure, well done, the best. I think you, it was just in timing that they actually put you at top, but you all got 10 out of 10. Then Alex, well done, and Tahir, next. Well done, all of you, very proud of you. All listened well and answered the survey well as well. Okay, the, a lot of you have been asking me for the dates for the assessments. Um, I haven't put these up on, um, on ECI yet, because I just want to just confirm that everything's fine, but these are all provisional dates. Um, assignment one is on grammar teaching and doing an activity based on grammar. That's due the 31st of August. Assignment two is going to be a presentation. You're going to be doing a workshop on how to teach writing as a process. So that'll be a PowerPoint recording or YouTube recording. How are you going to do this presentation for me? So I'm looking forward to seeing you all. Assignment three is going to be designing an exam um, with a memorandum for a language um, paper and for a writing paper. So that's basically going to be what you're going to do. Um, I'm going to give you the topic. So this will prevent you from just downloading exam papers from the department. And again, we're going to finish off with a critical reflection of what we've done this semester. And then assignment five again is the online tasks and um, the ones that have been marked. So those of you that put in a bit of energy into it, we'll see that you've got some nice marks this semester for assignment five. Keep that up and you have a nice little bonus at the end of this traumatic year. All right. Okay, so I'm quickly going to speak a bit about assignment one. 
um, it's the topic is contextualized grammar teaching practices. So that means it mustn't be isolated and must be related to a context. Um, so what you have to do is start thinking about this, try and find your article. You've got to find something that's topical. That means it's happened this, this year, not in 2013 or when you were born. It's got to be local. That means it must be South Africa. It can't be related to India or Pakistan or Afghanistan. Um, and it must be kind of persuasive that it's going to try and influence people about something that is something to do with some social circumstances. It can be vaccinating, it can be crime, it can be gender-based violence. We're going to have a look at a few kinds of social issues, but it's got to be a newspaper article or a magazine article, something related to something like that in South Africa. Okay. So you're going to design an assessment activity, which is going to be related to grammar, not what is a verb and what is a noun, but it's going to be related to the text that you're going to be giving questions on. And you've also got to address the different cognitive levels in your questioning. Then you're going to give a marking guide, putting the ticks, putting the marks in, showing what counts as marks, putting rubrics in, depending on how you're going to work out your marking guide. Then you're going to reflect on this grammar activity. Okay, that's the last section. Um, it's always important to take time to reflect. You might say, oh, it's a bit hard. The questions might be difficult. I don't think it's topical enough. Um, I should have found something more persuasive. The visual, you've got to have a visual in your article as well. I should have checked my questions, but you get to do some kind of reflection on it. And whether it is important to teach grammar implicitly, that's with your inductive discovery type methods, or directly, explicitly. You tell them what the rule is, and you have lots of draws on that. So you're going to comment on that. You don't have to write a whole book about it. You just have to write a paragraph. What do you think is best how to teach grammar? And then think of five grammar teaching principles with an example. So I think it's important to teach grammar and writing together because they're going to learn how to use the word in an applied context, something like that. But um, there are going to be many examples. I've got lots of tips for you today. Right. So. Your assignment, you've got to get a text that's topical, persuasive. There's got to have a picture on it, some kind of visual. And it's got to have some kind of social message about you should be vaccinated, you shouldn't be vaccinated, something like that. So what about stand up and speak out against poverty and equality? That would be some kind of social issue as well. What about equality and diversity? What about people that are using wheelchairs, have lost limbs, those kind of issues? What about you, my body is not your crime scene? The whole thing about violence against men, against women, against people. What about COVID prevention and the vaccination? These are all social issues at the moment. Then you can have grammar activities which must be integrated into the text. You can't just ask isolated grammar questions and say, is this word the an article? It's just not related to the meaning of the message. It must be words and questions related to the context of that. So you've got to be critical about the text that's been used, the message, the use of questions, as well as the visual that you, the person is showing in the picture and using persuasive language as well. So here's an example, um, the threat of COVID-19 is affecting people in across Africa and you can have the visual picture there. You've got a bit of an article that's from News24. Um, you could look at negative words. Why has the, what, the person has used really negative words? like threat, which is a negative word. There is um, support for stay at home, which is also a very negative concept, the whole thing of lockdown. Also the idea of two thirds of people are going hungry, all negative aspects of COVID. So you could say, what negative aspects are picked up in this article about gender-based violence, for instance. You've also got the positive words that you can look at. And these are things like, um, the COVID-19 has been effective in suppressing transmission so far. So all the methods that we've been using have been effective. I don't know how effective they have been. And the whole idea is the confirmed cases in Africa remain relatively low. And that is a positive message that's coming through. So it's not, you're not asking what the ad adjective is. You say which words show that there's been a positive or negative effect with COVID. Um, these, there's got to be tasks with your grammar relating to visual literacy. Um, what are you seeing in the picture? That lady with all the bananas on her head with the type of um, blurred effect they had. They focused on her, not the people. Were they wearing masks? Weren't they wearing masks? What was the angle? Um, 
So the visual, what is it saying? There is a social issue, stop bullying, see it, say it, stop it. Um, wear a mask, the whole importance of wearing a mask. Then there's also going to possibly a summary writing section. Um, these are all indicated in the task. So how do you write summaries? Go back and look at um, the CAPS document and see whether you've got to use a point form or a paragraph when you write a summary. What about register and style? How formal or informal is the writing? Is it a very formal article? What would show that it is formal? Why is it formal? Or is it very informal? Um, get out, get up, get by, get away. Um, why are they very informal? They're using their contractions, they're using simple words. Um, why is that important for the message? What about language structures and conventions? All your um, sentence structures, are they incomplete sentences? Are they just using a lot of commands or lots of capitalization? What about the spelling? What about the use of inverted commas? Um, that kind of language question, which I know you all love. All right, so are there spelling errors? Um, what kind of sentence structures are they using? Why are they using simple sentences? Why are they using compound sentences? Why are they building certain words? So think about those. Why are certain words in italics? And then social discourse. Um, I'm going to give you a list of social discourse type questions. They're all from, um, from Ferreira. So I'll add that into my little lecture that I'm going to give you. It's words like that are positioning people. When you say us, means I'm different to you. If I say you, or them, they are different to me. So how are they using pronouns to isolate people from other people? But oh, there's a whole list of them. I think I've got seven of them that you can need to look at if you're looking at social discourse. Um, what about overused words like big, bad, fun, good, happy, like? They're using words that are very simple. Why are they using these kinds of words? Here's an example of the type of positive and negative words, um, euphemisms, things, saying things in a nicer way. Um, and often articles will use that as part of social discourse to distance themselves from the horribleness of what's actually happening. Um, yes, this is from an article about when 200 KZN students tested positive and how did the university put this news over? So here are two ways they put over. First of all, they said they have died, the death. These are very direct ways of saying, horrible news, okay? But if you say someone sadly succumbed to the virus, it's a more euphemistic way of saying something. So this is how you can look at word use. Um, are they very direct and to the point? Why are they quite blunt by saying they died from the virus? Why did this other one, why did the university say they succumbed to the virus, which is a gentle way of saying things? So look at, go and look through articles in newspapers, go and um, go into BBC, they've got some nice articles there, but that's not really South Africa. News 24 has got, think of a social issue that's happening in, in South Africa and how you're going to find an article with a picture to discuss that. Um, here is the gun use in schools in the USA. Fear has no place in school, ban assault rifles, um, not really relevant to South Africa, but it is a global issue as well. Killing children in school with, guns that are not licensed. I think maybe crime is also a bit like that in South Africa. Yes, yeah, COVID um, vaccines now for 13 to 18 year olds, it's an issue. Or must we hold off vaccinating children? It's look for an article saying that teens should not be vaccinated. Um, we must prioritize our adults. Um, so it could be that controversial type of article. What about this incident when a case it in um, child has just died this year? Um, from COVID-related death. Um, there's the picture, you have the whole article about it. Um, there's a lot of pictures about this little nine-year-old um, primary school child who, who passed away and the effect of this heartbreaking time on her students, their fellow learners. And there you can see what happened at Acacia Vale Primary School um, when they lost their, their fellow student. This is from the article as well. Um, you can think of happy words, things like she had a heart of gold. Um, her smile and her greeting, all right? So she, all the happy words in the article, but then you've also got all the sad words like grief, inconsolable grief, it's so painful. And um, the hearse um, is where they carry the coffin in, her body, all these things saying final goodbyes are all very sad words. So you can look at happy and sad words, positive and negative words in the way they are expressed in these articles. So um, yes, unit one is grammar and use in the, in the uh, FFL classroom. Um, and today we're going to look at integrated grammar teaching strategies, because this is going to support assignment one. Are you confused, okay, about grammar? 
all these things you've got to know. Don't worry, you don't have to be. Um, because just learning grammar, those rules, is going to have no effect on raising the quality of student writing as long if you don't integrate grammar into actual writing and other practices as well. So go to chapter 13, page 194, Ferreira, and you get all your information on this as well. And then we'll go on to references and resources and structures assessing um, grammar in the week four. Okay, so again, I'm going to reiterate, grammar teaching is not an isolated rule-based activity. And then you've got a little sign, there are no rules, okay? It's best done in context. That's why this one is a contextualized assignment where you're going to use grammar in context. Um, you can't just go and study tenses and word classes or parts of speech. It must be part of the text that they are reading. So if you're going to look at tenses, go and look for a report. And there's a lot of negative use of words there. The, sorry, past tense use of words. Um, or if you want word classes, go and look at a very descriptive piece of writing. And there you'll find lots of different parts of speech as well. So you've got to produce, you've got to speak or write grammar rules, or you've got to encounter them while you're listening or you're reading something. So these are the different ways you're going to use text and you're gonna integrate grammar into it. Okay, so you've got to structure the input processing to get the students proficient, okay? It says, out of context, grammar instruction with no connection to authentic writing often leads to student disengagement. So out of context, those writing out the rules, learning things verbatim, are not going to lead to authentic use of the language, gaining grammatical understanding, and students are going to become very disengaged with what you're doing. So research has showed that your proficiency in language will improve when you encourage discussions about the grammar. Why was the past tense used in the report writing? That the students have read, they've been reading, they've heard you speaking, spoken, and written. That's where they can encounter these different grammatical items. And then you're going to push them. It's not going to be easy. It's easier for them just to regurgitate and recite rules. But by making them discuss these rules, by structured input and processing, they will gain increased proficiency. I hope this makes a bit of sense. And it must be learner-centered. It mustn't be the teacher telling all the time. So teaching and learning grammar, there's different ways you can look. And I've put a little um, link here. I'm sorry for those of you that don't like my picture overlays, but just delete them. Go into my slides and just delete, delete, and you'll get the writing at the bottom. It's called the busy teacher. And you can get how to integrate grammar and writing together. So you can see there's a link there, how you can learn grammar implicitly. Okay, that means not only telling, but then exploring the language as well, which is the explicit part. But the language journey is more complicated than simple grammar rules. Just remember that. So remember the top of the iceberg, remember Bix and Kelp. Students are good at doing grammar exercises. They can change everything to the past continuous very easily, but they can't often apply it in a sense in their writing. However, when it comes to applying grammar in writing, they fall short. So they can do the exercises. And I've had countless experiences with this. Students know exactly how to do those grammar rule worksheets, but when they come to write or speak, they make a big mess up. So why does this happen? Hmm? Think about it. It's most likely because the teacher is just teaching writing and grammar as separate concepts. So they don't see the link between writing and grammar. So I'm going to give you a few strategies to make writing more part of your grammar classroom. Okay. There's the, the for grammar sheets from Busy Teacher. You, if you want to go and get grammar sheets, which are showed in an integra integrated way, I suggest you go and have a look at the site as well. And there's free adjective worksheets, all done in an integrated way. So you can go and check that link up at the top there. So tip one, provide examples and models for your students. So if you can teach the past tense, give them a report where they can see the use of that tense in writing. So when you introduce your grammar concept, give them a model with a text or picture which illustrates that nicely. So here we've got again COVID and vaccination because that's what's happening in the world today. And you want to look at present tense. And you can go and look at the heading there. Data, research data indicates deaths from COVID. And there you go with use of R in the sentence. Um, so you get an idea of the use of the present tense in that. 
Um, if you look at the, the caption at the bottom, they've got the present perfect. Cape Town researchers have suggested. And then you can ask them to write that as what are they busy doing? And then they can change it into the continuous tense as well. I've also given you the link at the bottom from the Daily Maverick. So for example, when you're teaching direct and indirect speech, which I think you all like, you can take a news article, any news article, any magazine article, and you can highlight the examples. They can go through it with a highlighter and say, these highlighted yellow ones, they love colors, are direct speech, and these blue ones are indirect speech. Then go and recognize it from the actual newspaper and the actual text. Let them bold or highlight sentences and ask them why they are written that way. So let them go and highlight the past tense verbs and say, why are they written in the past tense? Why do you think? So discuss the grammar with them. Here's an example um, showing you the use of direct speech. You can see the, the verbatim words, inverted commas. This is also from the Daily Maverick. Um, here's another example that shows the indirect use when they say estimated that. And you can also ask them to change the one to the indirect speech, and you can ask them to change the direct to the indirect, and you can ask them what is the effect of making it direct or indirect, okay? So we saw tip one, the examples and models. Um, you can show them two copies of the same article, one with direct speech, and one with indirect speech, and you can say what is the difference? How does the one feel? How does the other one feel? Often the direct speech is easier to understand, it's more conversational, whereas the indirect is more formal. Let them compare and contrast. What were the grammar rules? How were they applied? Well, I noticed they were just using the present tense in the direct speech, but when they put it in the indirect speech, everything changed to the past tense. They used I, and now they're using he, the pronoun changed. They might work out all those rules himself without you explicitly telling them that. So alternatively, show them a text after you have, if you want to be the explicit teacher, who's gonna tell them the rules beforehand, then let them look at the text afterwards and let them try and find those rules and see how it is used in a real authentic text. Then ask them to go and find examples of the rules that you have just taught in that article that they're looking at. And here's an example, there's McKees there when he was still Minister of Health, um, showing the direct speech and what he's saying, what tenses are he's using. There is another example of his direct speech. Um, this is um, Shabir of the Wits University, who also uses a bit of quotation. And finally, Debbie Bradshaw is also using a bit of um, direct speech there as well that has been taken from her. How can it be changed? How can it be applied? How can it ch be changed to indirect speech? Here's some more vaccination. How many, how many of you had vaccinations? And says in the heading, please, no, please sorry, don't wait, vaccinate. Only 7% of South Africa jabbed as patients plead doctors to please help me survive. Okay, this is, you can say, don't wait, vaccinate. You can say, make this a full sentence. How can you write this without the apostrophe, without the comma? Um, how can you make jabbed more formal? What is the effect of making it more formal? What is the use of the inverted commas there? Um, how can you make it more direct speech? How can the rules be applied? So these are ways that you can look at language and speak about it. Okay, you can take the heading and you can change it. So we start tip one. Um, if you want to teach the present perfect, that is remember have and has. Here is a BBC article um, which looks at a young girl who was trying to film what was happening during lockdown. And yeah, you can see the different tenses that are used here, which they could go and recognize from the article. They can compare and contrast the past simple, the present perfect, and present perfect events. And there you can see a teenager has filmed. What tense is that? What does it mean when, that she has filmed? She used her mom's camera. What tense is that? Why is that used? Um, in the second, um, I think it's in the third, the third paragraph, she actually uses the the present tense, um, the film deals. So why was why has it gone from present perfect to present to past to to um to past tense? Okay, so you can have a look at all those uses and you can try and explain why this has happened. She has now uploaded the film onto Amazon Prime streaming platform. So also the use of the present perfect. So you're actively using the tense. You're not just writing sentences with tenses. 
And there she is as well. So I have school, work, faith, exercise, the virus in relationships and family life, all the things that she does during her lockdown time. Still tip one, we're gonna move on quickly now. Um, whether you use texts before or after, okay, we know you, you have to use them. So don't just have them, just the rules. You, you can teach the rules if you're desperate to teach explicitly um, and then they can go and find the rules in the, in, the, in the authentic tasks and texts, or you can let them go and find it, then work out the rule themselves. Being a realistic context is critical for learners. It must be real, topical, something they can relate to. If they can't understand the situation or the patterns, which, which is in the grammar, they will not be able to move beyond basic drills. So they don't understand how to use, they might be able to do your drills, but they won't increase their proficiency. So that's something to think about. So seeing grammar in other people's writing will empower them to become confident with these structures in their own writing. So just remember just being isolated and knowing the drills is not gonna make them empowered to actually go and write. They have to, you have to link your grammar rules with a text somewhere, okay? Yes. Step two, writing a day, a writing a day per day keeps the errors away, remember? Apple a day keeps the doctor away. If you do the, give a student something to write every day, you will keep the errors away. So after introducing and practicing a grammar concept, give them a short informal writing task to do. So you can say, okay, now you're gonna write a paragraph in the past tense, okay? To illustrate the grammar concept. And this is how you can do it. You can give them a prompt, okay? Something that'll help them write in that tense to elicit the structure. And then they can produce that grammar more naturally than actually the sentence draws. And here's the examples. Here's a whole lot of prompts, these little, what will you do if, okay? So if you think about this one, number 187, think of a present you received, okay? Think of a present you received. How did you react? This is the past tense. When I got that present, I thanked the person and opened the gift. I then saw that I had got, can you see, you're using past tense all the time now. So give them a prompt and then write a little paragraph about that. What about this one? Describe the most insecure person you know and what makes them so insecure. Okay, my friend is insecure because she still likes to sleep with her mother. Okay, so can you see I'm using the simple tense now, um, the present, present tense, and um, because it's asked in the present tense, so I'm forced to use the present tense. What about this one? Think of the most miserable person you have ever met. Devise a plan to cheer them up. Okay, what tense are you going to use? Okay, you can use the future tense. I will bake him a cake, then I will go and visit him, and then we will go for a walk to the beach. Okay, I will. So you're using the future. So these prompts will force them to actually use the tense you want them to use. Think of a time when you found out that people were talking about you, have been talking about you. What did they say about you? Okay, they said that I was. Can you see you're using the past tense straight away, all right? They said that I, I hit the boy. I had hit the boy, okay? Present perf past perfect. So these are ways, the prompts that you can get going to get them to use the actual tense. Okay, so writing a day keeps in errors away. So by writing frequently, you're building the learner's association with grammar and writing. So they see the grammar fits in with the writing. And we also emphasize in writing more than the grammar. Um, and this enforces the idea that language learning is not simply memorizing rules. So they know it's not about memorizing what the present sense looks like. They know how it is used in writing about something that's happening now. That is the only rule. No rules, okay? Tip three. What about when they make errors? Oh, we love error, errors. Okay, to correct or not to correct, that is the question. How do we deal with error correction? So each time you evaluate an essay, write down a few sentences from different learners that contain some error. Okay, so you write from their work. It's real, it's authentic. It's a good warm-up warm -up activity as well to make a worksheet with all these little errors and let them go over it as a class. Remind them that everyone makes mistakes, even the teacher, yes, I make lots of mistakes, and that each learner has one error in that worksheet. So you're not alone, you're not exempt, you're all part of that. So they're dealing with their own work and the errors there. After they've practiced 
and corrected these errors, they can return to their writing and try and revise and improve it. So this was my essay. These were all the errors found. This is what we've revised. I'm going to go back now and correct my essay. All right. It's not all going to be wrong. It's going to be right now. So tip four, design your rubric with grammar in mind. So when you've got a task, make sure you've got a section with, with for language use. Um, Rather than taking language, language risks, some students would rather just write simple sentences. I went to the movies, okay? Simple sentences, it makes it easier for them. So how can you get them into using more complex structures? You've got to get them to practice using complex sentences, comp compound sentences, um, so they get out of this simplistic way of writing. So design your rubric saying how many simple sentences, if you've got three simple sentences, but you've got two complex, um, you try and get them different aims and purposes in writing so they will try and use the different sentence structures. So here's an example of um, grammar and sentence structure. And the sentences are clear and easy to understand. Each sentence contains an idea and there are low grammar mistakes. Okay, they get very good there and there's your, your actual rubric. Or here's another one, um, your grammar. There are limited errors in capitalization, punctuation and spelling. So they get a level four there. On the other side, there's many errors in capitalization, punctuation, and spelling. So if you're going to be focusing on punctuation and spelling errors, you put a part on your rubric where you're actually going to give them the benefit of a higher mark if they've got no spelling errors and they've got good use of capitalization and punctuation. Your sentence fluency, um, they go right down to the bottom, emerging, developing, effective, and strong. Most sentences are incomplete and run on. They're short sentences, they all start with the same word. There's problems with sentence structure and grammar affects meaning. Very difficult to read. Okay, that will put them in that category. So by designing this rubric with grammar in mind, you can also tell learners that they can have a minimum number of structures in their writing. For example, you must say they must have five examples of the past perfect. He had run, he had wept. Okay, they must have those examples. Um, you can have a point system which rewards that targeted grammar. So if they get one point, if they've got, they only get one point if they've got a simple sentence. They get five points if they use compound sentences. They get 10 points for every compound complex sentence they use. So this can benefit their marks as well. And then they will actively try and use those different sentence structures. That's the way to get them doing it. Remind the students that often essays that are awarded higher points, and this is with IELTS and so on, they use complicated sentence structures, not long sentences, but a nice compound or complex sentence. So they should start practicing it now. Daddy, do you like my picture? And he says to honey, if you like me to be objective, I'll have to create a rubric. So rubrics are so important to focus on grammar sections and other section structures that we need in the writing. Number five, tip five, use pictures in your class. I love pictures as you've seen on my, my, my slides. Okay, some grammat grammatical structures are difficult to bring out in writing, so pictures might help you. For example, the present continuous is used infrequently, not often, compared with the, the present simple. He has a link, you can go and check that out. So to get all tenses, use pictures in your writing class. Depending on the particular grammar structure you're teaching, pictures gives writers the freedom to practice any tense. So get your pictures right. Um, yes, this is from BBC News. Um, the top left one says pure devastation and guilt of British Afghans in Afghanistan now. Second picture says they said it was gay panic. We believe that's wrong. How hard is it to recycle a jumbo jet? Um, the one with the fire, it was chaos. The only way was through the flames. And in the last visual, I'm not a terrorist, just a boy who spoke English. Okay, now what, how could you get them to speak about this using different tenses. You can say, what are they doing? She is telling about what happened to the British Afghanistans in Afghanistan. What is the boy doing? He is telling the people why he's not a terrorist. Okay, so you can use that prompt. What has happened? Um, they were trying to um, recycle all the elements of the jumbo jet. What has happened? There were a fire broke out. Okay, so you actually telling it in the past tense. What about what will you tell your mother or your friend about the boy at the bottom bottom right here? 
I would tell my mother that he is not a terrorist. Okay, he was only speaking English. So you, you, you're telling in the future tense and you're going to use different tenses to try and explain that. So use pictures, give them prompts and get them to speak about it. So with pictures to elicit writing, what about celebrities? They're all like celebrities. Um, yeah, Steve Jobs, you know him, he was the Apple mastermind. And there he is with the Apple iPhone. Um, what you do in this exercise, you've got seven quotes about Steve Jobs. You get them to read all those quotes beforehand. Here's one of them, because people who are crazy enough to change the world are the ones who will actually do it. Okay, so go through all of that. Um, then you can listen to the whole audio on Steve Jobs. And these are the questions that you can answer. There's a lot of chronological, what year this happened, what year that happened. And then you can have a general discussion. So this is one way to use celebrities to get people talking and thinking about language. What about people? Let them compare people. We've got Arnold Schwarzenegger is taller than Tom Cruise. He's also bigger, but Tom is the better actor. So I'm using these comparison words to actually explain it. There's Arnold Schwarzenegger. I think he's um, about five foot eight, not too tall. And Tom Cruise, I think about five foot two. He's very, very short. Um, so these are things that you can prompt and you can compare people. He's taller than me, he's shorter than me, fatter than me, thinner than me. And you use these comparisons. What about songwriters? Um, they're all into the music or actors. Um, see what they have to say about it. Um, these are different sitcoms that I got off the internet, the Big Bang Theory, all the comedies, Glee, Modern Family, um, The Office, Parks and Recreation. I don't know that one. And then this rock thing. Okay, I haven't ever watched those, but they might know you can you know what your students are, get them to look at the different sitcoms and to compare. And if you fall short, always go to iPhones um, or different smartphones and they'll have lots to compare. This one's better, this one's faster, this one's clearer, this one's got more pixels, um, this one's got bat better battery life. So all those things they can, this charges for so much, this needs that, blah, blah, blah. they can make a whole book about phones, smartphones. Okay, need device really. So pictures to get writing. What about just a picture of someone's emotions and face like this? And you could say for present continuous, what is happening? Okay, she has, she is listening to a sad story on the radio. Okay, well, she is, she is seeing what is happening to the poor person. Okay, so you're using the present continuous tense. For present perfect, you can show a picture of a person, ask the students to write down life experiences of this person. So, um, what has happened to her? Okay. She has experienced um, a loss of a friend and she is feeling very sad. Okay. So you can actually use that kind of question. For advanced learners, you can ask them to predict what's going to happen in the future using the future simple tense and the future, future perfect continuous. Um, what will what will happen now? She will have to go and see um, someone to help her out of the situation. She will need to go to a doctor. So you can actually think about things that she will need to do. Okay, so those are ways you can use pictures. You can have happy pictures too. Yeah, it's a happy picture. Right, um, what are they doing? What will they be doing? Why are they doing that? Um, to get them to use different tenses. Okay, you can use three prompts for each of the pictures. They can bring their own pictures and they can explain what that what's happening. Um, What's happening is a question you can ask. And often you'll have the present continuous and they'll be speaking about things that they know and they have encountered in authentic communication situations. So choose any picture from a magazine. Uh, make sure there's a lot going on, like an airport or restaurant, family doing things outdoors. Show them the picture. Or I think best they give them their own pictures, have them bring their own pictures. Say so what is happening in the picture? What are the people doing? Can you see the all present continuous? What are they doing? What are they thinking? Okay. And then we've got people walking towards a plane. Um, they've all got masks on. What is happening in this picture? They are walking down the runway to get to the plane. Um, they obviously may be leaving a different place. Um, what are they thinking? They're thinking about people they're leaving behind. So you can discuss that. There's more people getting onto an aircraft. Things that we can't do so often anymore um, that easily. I've had to cancel once already, wanting to go to Johannesburg when the whole lockdown happened. Um, again, where are these people going? What are they doing? I see they're not wearing masks. Why are they not wearing masks? 
Here's a group of people sitting at campus chatting. What are they doing? What are they thinking? So look at also headlines. Um, headlines might spark a great speaking activity. Um, give a glimpse into the newspaper magazine headline language as well. Um, so learners to open the magazines, to list some of the headlines that they can see, yeah, write them, and ask them to predict what the article is about. So say to them, find three headings that you like and predict what the article is about. Write lists of topics that correspond to these headlines and ask them to match the topic with the actual article. And there's so much on coronavirus and quarantine and death and vaccinations, um, masks, um, seniors at risk, the whole thing. So you can give them a whole lot of headlines and then the articles and they can match with that as well. That's giving you key ideas. So sort of pictures, find the difference. Um, so learners, two magazine pictures in similar situations. People have in the office playing sport, showing different emotions, and then say, what, how are they the same and how are they different? Okay, here we've got a Muslim guy and here's another guy. Um, so how are they the same? Yeah, they're both male. Um, they seem to be about the same age. They're wearing casual clothes. Um, how are they different? One's got a, they both got beards, one's got a longer beard. Um, they seem to both have dark hair as well. Um, they're both smiling, yes, and but the one is obviously Muslim and the other one is some other faith, okay? Yeah, again, how are they different? How are they the same? How are they different? How are they the same? So the learners must do something all the time. They can't just listen to the teacher telling them the rule. They've got to apply that rule and do something. So one of the best, biggest disservices we can do to our learners is to fail to get in practical situations to apply the grammatical knowledge. How can they apply the knowledge all the time? Um, without these sort of strategies, obviously, um, and they're not going to use the language, it's going to be quite useless to do this, to do grammar with them. Hopefully these tips will encourage you to integrate grammar into various reading, speaking, listening, and writing contexts, okay? You just have to do something all the time. You can't just regurgitate the rule, write it out. You have to apply it in a writing situation somewhere. So go and look at Ferreira, um, page 198. She's a reflection on the use of descriptive or prescriptive grammar. Descriptive um, is when they try and find out things. Prescriptive is when you tell them. It's like explicit and implicit. It's the same as inductive and deductive, this kind of teaching of grammar. Also go look at Ferreira on page 199 to 201, and she gives some strategies on how to remember words. And she's got the word knobbly and callous. Let's see how she's got four rules that you can apply to remember words. Um, she's taken this one from Oswald Machali. He's a wonderful poet, poet, and he's called The Washerwoman's Prayer. And it's very short four lines. Look at her hands, raw, knobbly, and callous. Look at her face like a bean seed soaked in brine. Okay, now there's lots of difficult words there. How can we approach this? Well, the first way, <coughs> excuse me, is to look in the dictionary. Um, there you'll often find how to spell the word, how to pronounce the word, you'll get all the meanings. So that's a very good idea to have a good dictionary or you've got Google and you can go and search there. Um, but there's also other ways you can have a look. And one of the first things for us is, is to find an image a visual of someone with callus, because the picture will put a memory thing. So if you think about knobbly, the previous word knobbly and callus, knobbly can be, knob is something that you turn to open a door or a radio, and, but knobbly is something with raised surfaces. So if she's got knobbly, she's got raised surfaces on her hands, okay, or on her feet or on her fingers. Callus is rough, hard skin. So the first thing we do is we show them the picture to get the visual. Then we're going to find a relationship with callus and any other parts of the body. So we can have something like this, a little mind map, and we put callus in the middle and we say, well, what can be callus? So I can have callus hands, callus knees, callus elbows, callus face, if it's very, very rough and there's lots of sun damage on your face. So think of all the things that can be callus, okay? Um, I think I've got calluses from writing as well on my fingers. Um, so those are things you form relationships. The next thing is to write down the word. You can see it's quite a difficult word, callused. Think about knobbly. It's a silent 
silent K, like knees and knobbly. So if the more they write it down and use it in little paragraph, maybe say use it five times in the paragraph, they will get to know how to spell it and how to use it in a sentence that makes sense. And then use the word. Okay, you're going to get them to tell you how, where they've seen calloused hands and why they were calloused. So you'll get them to use the word. There is the word callous. If you go onto Google, there's also a way that you can hear the word and how to sit calloused hands, um, hard skin on your hand. So there's the picture and you can practice using the words. You can use it by first getting the visual of the word, maybe first by dictionary, then the visual, then the relationship using a mind map, then actually writing down the word and then actively using the word. So do something with your language and with your words. And... If you don't get them to do something, they are not going to learn and they're going to fall asleep. Okay, so next week we may look at some resources. I've been battling to get a Zoom presentation. There's just not enough Zoom slots. It was supposed to be a Zoom today um, and there weren't slots for me. So um, this is why you've got a canned recording today. But um, next week, I'm not sure if I've got a Zoom session, but um, I think it's going to come in the calendar. Once I've got all the sessions, I will let you know which is going to be Zoom. I'll also put a calendar up and a work thing on the welcome section. Okay. If you are confused, um, please email me. Uh, marks at this point are all in. All the mark amendments have gone through. Um, they've gone through my head of department. They've gone through the dean. They will then go to administration who will insert the marks. But you will not see them because it's all done undercover um, until they've got final decisions made on the marks. And then they will be released when the final marks are released. OK, I hope that makes sense. Have a good week. Stay safe. Stay warm. Um, and I'll chat to you again, either through email or next time through ECI. Bye for now.